Hello, my name is Michelle Carl, and I'm the author of Daisy and Wolf, which has just been published by Hachette. So I'm going to be reading today for Westwards um, a chapter from a section from my novel. Um, the novel takes the character of Daisy Simmons, who is an Indian woman of mixed ancestry, and um, it's it's set in 1924 and there's also an Australian narrator who's narrating the story and trying to find and discover and learn about Daisy um, and she is um, writing in 2017 amidst um, Trump's presidency and Brexit and so forth, um, the ban on Muslims and all the racist um, upheavals and climate disasters of the time. Um, and um, Daisy Simmons is a character from Mrs. Dalloway, um, a novel which Virginia Woolf wrote, um, and uh, she's a minor, mi a very minor character, but she also has an important role because she's the reason that uh, Clarissa Dalloway's lover, Peter Walsh, has returned from India to arrange Daisy's divorce because Peter's actually uh, proposed to marry Daisy. So. Um, in my novel, I expand on Daisy's reduced story and give her agency voice. I give her um, a journey and um, show her transition through various life struggles as she comes up against racism and um, the elitism of empire. So I will start, take a section from this chapter. S.S. Ranchi, Kidapur. 17th of April 1924, Thursday evening. I was going to skip a little. My mind was churning, despite the battery of sights, noises and smells. Foremost was the dread of leaving Bunny and Mrs Burgess. I was determined to be strong for Charlotte and not to weep. I could shed a few tears, but the knowledge that I should protect my children and not allow them to gaze too deeply into possibility was never lost on me. We set off from Calcutta after nine that morning, piloted by a smaller vessel through the treacherous sandbanks. The rapidity by which ships and foreign sailors had been lost to the quicksands was common knowledge, so our cautious progress came as no surprise. The wind blew and the sun burned fiercely on our faces. There was much to admire in the vista of Calcutta's spires and country boats, the villas and fine palatial homes owned by British civil servants and merchants gracing the foreshore, the botanic gardens and the spectacle of domed roofs, the high court tower and company buildings. We passed sugar and jute factories and mango orchards. Downstream was a very different site. Single story bungalows sprawled out along the mud banks. We saw vultures perched on the remains of the dead, floating in the river. Dows carry, carrying stacked hay from the fields ploughed the turgid water. Embankments were strewn with washed clothes pegged with small rocks, magnolia trees and lone palms bending in the breeze. Soundings were taken at frequent intervals by the first officer as we steamed past mustard fields and the occasional temple towards the delta of the dun-coloured Huli. It was very hot near the boiler room where the Lascars worked hard, dressed in dotis and headscarves stoking and feeding the furnaces. Two Lascars stood with legs astride behind the steering wheel on the main deck. They were handsome in red embroidered caftans, cuddy pants and matching red turbans. Charlotte had discovered there were many children on board. The steward had told me there were upwards of 90. She had already made the acquaintance of Wilhelmina, a girl travelling with her parents, who were who are returning to Port Adelaide. They live on an outback station, so I guessed they must have been on vacation in India. Wilhelmina has piercing blue eyes and a most cheerful disposition. Charlotte pointed out to her the dome of the post office and other landmarks that she recognised as we left Calcutta. 
The river widened, the sand shifts and streams causing clearer, shallow water as we approached Holdia. We were now in the Sundarbans Channel, which would take us to the Bay of Bengal. With the current, we started to see white caps and porpoises playing in the clear, sparkling water as it slapped against the hull. A two-day stretch across the horizon to our west was the palm tree-lined coast of Chittagong, Cox's Bazaar and Akyab in Burma, where another great river flows. The company my father runs has been issuing licenses to the steamships. They ferry mail to the landlocked villages and towns, as well as exporting rice and other provisions. We stood on the deck, gazing at the white sands, lined by palm trees, imagining beyond to its prosperous fields of fattened crops, blessed by rain and the goddess Lakshmi. I thought of friends who had left India for other reasons than mine, but with no less risk. Some, like my grandfather, had landed small fortunes. He sometimes reminisced about the years he spent in Chittagong. Perfectly lovely scenery, the deep gorges and wooden hills, the orchids and wild turmeric. Even now I can picture the outlook from his plantation home. The pretty sight of sailing vessels docked in the river and the ocean farther still beyond the woods. Too many insects and the servants were lazy and overpaid, he once complained to my father. But he told us a different story, conjuring in my mind an idyllic country, pagodas, butterflies, missionaries, emerald moss-covered waterfalls, and the blue distant hills. Even if the jungle has perils, I was captivated. It was like being charmed the way he described Burma. Bengali immigrants had been arriving in Rangoon for decades to work in the rice mills along the Irrawaddy River, or to man the ports and stations, or to serve in the banks, even to pull rickshaws. But there were also revolutionaries in the Mandalay prison, as there are in the Andaman Islands. Forgive me for saying this, but the British are brutal with their taxes and their prisons. This is how they governed and prospered. This is how they weakened the Indians. We were warned that a few miles into the inlets we might catch sight of tribesmen, naked rowing sampans. I pictured them staring at us through dense vegetation with their dark insurgent eyes. Preparing for departure from the mouth of the muddy river, the unknown exaggerates our apprehensions and plays upon our fantasies of fear. I pray for courage and determination and all that is required to keep my mind and moods in balance. We passed through a strong current, the steamer began to pitch and rock and the wind grew more turbulent. Radhika looked pale from the abrupt effects of nausea. By now it was far less pleasant on the deck, a few passengers had vomited, others had retired to the forward cabin. As the motion sickness increased, I felt limp, and so I had Radhika fetch Charlotte and told her we must all rest a few hours. Our cabin in the second class is more modest than I could have imagined. Two bunk beds, a desk and a chair, a few shelves and hanging space built into the casement, leaving space for a rug and a bucket of water, a quota of which is rationed daily. The small window caked in the flaky residue of salt allows some daylight to enter the room, but the jalousies are stiff to open. There is much congestion around these basic quarters and men who show signs of drunkenness loitering near the washroom. It is no small relief that our door can be locked with a key. I brought with me some fabrics, several yards of silks and pashminas to keep us warm. On our bunk beds, Charlotte and I each have a pillow. Radhika sleeps in the space beneath the beds on a mat which we pulled out from under the desk. She's only 19, married at 11. She seemed afraid to sleep in the in-between deck steerage where the women and men are cramped together. How they sleep there is a wonder with the unbearable heat and all of them in a heap near the stalls where some cows, hens and goats are kept. We know very little about Radhika's family. 
except that her husband was schooled by Methodist missionaries and is now teaching the Locust children in their village in Bihar. It was through the mission that she came to us. Her parents are Christians. They live a good 50 miles from Patna where Thaman is rife. The poor girl has suffered from rickets for most of her life and is very short. Once during the monsoons, when the ayah's room at home was flooded, Radhika rolled her sari above her knees to keep out the rising water, and I was shocked by how spindly her legs were. She's a diligent girl. She speaks a little English and understands more. There is nothing of the tinge of contempt about her, nothing like the abrasive glances of high caste women. Yet, like the beautiful servant girls who come from the upstream villages, those who know innocence as if they were soulmates, she has not a pinch of personal ambition, nor does vanity mar her character or her countenance. This gives her a stoic dispossession, even a simple dignity.